All right, how's it going, everybody? We are here on Wednesday of week nine uh, for our second video of the of the week right here. Uh, last video, we talked about our hypothesis tests. We're gonna carry that uh, through to today. We saw two examples in the last video, um, but I'm going to kind of claim that I think that there was something a little bit weird about those examples there, and we're gonna kind of, in a sense, rectify that today. Uh, in total, there are three different hypothesis tests uh, that are covered in chapter nine. We saw the most simple one, or the one that I think that we're the most comfortable with um, in the last video, and we're gonna see two that are very, very, very similar uh, to that one today that are, they're gonna have a, a slight variation to them, but we need to just pay attention to what information we're given. We'll be able to easily distinguish between each of these tests here. So today, in a sense, we're getting two new hypothesis tests, but again, our broad structure of the hypothesis test is exactly the same thing. So we're really just seeing two new examples today that uh, come from a very slightly different mathematical perspective here. So we'll do some very slightly different computations. Um, so we're going to expand our view in one sense in that uh, last video we only talked about averages instead of uh, also perhaps talking about population proportions. So we're going to talk about proportion tests today instead of just tests for mu. The other thing we're going to do is to clarify our perspective on one of them. This is what we're going to do first here, which is to say I think that some of the examples that we did yesterday are a little bit hokey in a sense. Um, we're going to talk about why today and see a slightly more appropriate computation to probably do in those scenarios here. So let's go ahead and start by looking at uh, our example from yesterday and talk about what's kind of weird about this. So this is our first example that we saw yesterday. Uh, we talked about average human body temperature. And in this example, we said, okay, so we said, uh, it's well known that human body temperature is 98.6 degrees with a standard deviation of 0.65 degrees. Um, a researcher believes that that average is, that the average should be lower than that. So she performs a test, a significance test to do so, collects the data, performs a significance test. So here's the thing that I think is a little bit weird about this one. Basically in this scenario, what we're doing is we're saying that we know that, so what do I think is, let me just kind of write some things right here. Um, what I think is kind of weird about this is um, that it's given that mu is 98.6 and that sigma is 0.65. We don't believe the mu value is correct. So the thing that I think is weird about this is where do mu and sigma even come from, right? What are we actually measuring with these things? Remember that mu is our population average and sigma is our population standard deviation. So the thing that's weird to me in this case is how would we know what maybe only sigma is but not know what mu is, right? We're making the claim here that we don't necessarily think that, we, that that mu value of 98.6 is correct. But if that were the case, then why would we also trust this sigma, which kind of had to have probably come from the same information, the same data, right? How is it that you could ever collect uh, in enough information to actually get you sigma, a population standard deviation, when you don't have enough information to properly collect mu, the population mean? These things kind of go hand in hand. And so I feel like in lots of cases, if you don't know that your average matches some population average, uh, it seems unlikely to me that you would actually know actually sigma in these cases as well. So a lot of these cases where we're saying we're not sure about the value of a population mean, uh, it doesn't really make sense for us to have a population standard deviation value because if you know the population standard deviation, the only way you could have collected that would be from collecting a sample of the entire population, in which case you should know the population mean. So the thing that's weird to me about this one is that we don't believe one of our population statistics or population parameters, mu, but we do believe another population parameter. Uh, either we kind of know them both or we don't know either of them, right? I mean, they're, they're, those, those kind of go hand in hand. The only way you could truly know your population parameters is if you performed a census and sampled the entire population. Um, so the slightly funky thing that happened in both of our examples yesterday is the entire process was about us debating over whether or not our value of mu was correct, our population mean. But in all of that process, we used a known value for sigma. Well, where would sigma come from? 
if we didn't really know mu? How could you collect data that would give you a population standard deviation with you not knowing the population mean? That kind of doesn't make any sense. So um, in general, it's very rare that we would ever know a population standard deviation when we don't know the population mean. Those are gonna kind of pretty much always be partners out there. Either you took a census or you didn't. Um, and so basically what we're kind of saying here today is I don't really think it's appropriate for us to be using a sigma piece of information to make computations if we're disbelieving mu as well. Maybe it makes more sense for us to actually just be using the standard deviation associated with the sample that we drew, right? Notice that this 0.65 is not the standard deviation of the sample of 33 people. The 0.65 is the generally claimed population average, not a sample average. But since we took a sample of people's temperatures, it's equally plausible that instead of just having coming up with the sample average of 98.45, we could have also come up with the sample standard deviation of whatever that was going to be, right? I'm assuming it's probably going to be pretty close to 0.65, but I'm not entirely sure because maybe that 0.65 was wrong as well there, right? Um, so in the cases where we're forming a hypothesis, performing, forming, performing, in the cases where we are performing a hypothesis test for the population mean, which is exactly the two examples that we did in the video yesterday, it's far more common for us to really only have our information from the sample rather than having um, standard deviation information from the whole population. We really just know the sample standard deviation, which we denote lowercase s as opposed to sigma right there. And by the way, s is supposed to be, I mean, it, S was correctly chosen. That is the first letter of sigma right there. That's a match on purpose. So it's much more typical. Like we have the, the sample mean in the video yesterday. We had the sample size in the video yesterday. But the thing that we're slightly changing now is to say, listen, it's kind of weird to suggest that we would know the population standard deviation but not know the population mean. That really doesn't ever actually happen. I shouldn't say never, but it's much, much more rare. Um, and so in general, what we'd like to do is slightly alter our computations to account for the fact that we really only know our sample standard deviation, not quite as good of information as knowing the entire population standard deviation. So since we don't know sigma in these cases, uh, we don't really actually have any way to use our normal distribution computations. Our normal distribution computations depend on knowing the value of sigma. But realistically, in most sampling cases, we don't know the true standard deviation of the whole population, sigma. We really just know the standard deviation of just our sample, which is less good information. And we want to account for the fact that we actually don't quite know as much as we were sort of claiming that we knew yesterday. So here's our, our broad paragraph kind of changing what we're going to see here right here today. In the cases where sigma is unknown, but S is known, in the cases where we don't know our population standard deviation, but we do know the standard deviation of the sample, the distribution of the sample mean will follow a, what is called a T distribution, which is very similar to a normal distribution, but it's a little bit different. We're going to see a comparative picture come up right here. Um, a little piece of interesting uh, history for you here. The T distribution, which I think in general is just as lame of a name as normal distribution. Is there anything? Uh, I, I, I Okay, now I'll, I'll throw two stories in here about the names of, of each of these distributions right here. Um, the T distribution does have a pretty cool backstory in that the T distribution was sort of discovered and in a sense academically popularized by um, a guy, uh, oh, oh gosh, I'm forgetting his name right now. Anyway, this is 1800s, and this guy was, the dilemma that he was running into was that he wanted to be able to test small batches of beer for what types of properties that beer had. Um, this guy was actually the head brewer at Guinness. Um, that was the statistician that uh, ultimately invented what is now an incredibly common statistical test performed probably millions of times per day across the world. Lots and lots and lots of t-tests going on out there. Um, and so I, just, I think it was pretty cool to be kind of a, the guy that came up with this, um, came up with it for beer related reasons. And he was the head brewer at Guinness at the time, um, which has always been a, a huge brewery. Um, my other, I, this just reminded me generally of a joke about normal. Um, uh, from a professor of mine in grad school talking about how so many things in math are talking about normal distributions and normalization of your factors. 
um, and standardization and regularization. And uh, his his joke was that he's like, man, it really seems like mathematicians have some have some really weird deep thing about always wanting everything to be normal and regular all the time. I wonder what that's all about. Uh, and I, I appreciated that joke about math nerds out there. So anyway, T distribution, it's cool. Um, it's referred to as the student's T distribution and student was sort of his academic pen name um, since he was the head brewer at Guinness. He wasn't supposed to be just like uh, publishing information that he came up with while under the employment of Guinness since that work was technically belonged to the brewery. Um, so the student T's distribution student was like his pen publishing name rather than using his real name when he published that stuff. So that's just where the name of this comes from here. So what's the deal with the T distribution? It's going to look a lot like a normal normal distribution. It's going to look like a bell-shaped curve, um, but it's going to be very technically not quite the exact same shape of a normal distribution. But uh, all of my freehand drawings, they're indistinguishable from each other. The T distribution is really just us admitting we don't have as much information as we previously claimed to know about the population, right? The T distribution is saying, listen, we really don't know the population standard deviation. The best we can do is just our little samples standard deviation here. So consequently, because we have less information about how our variable is distributed, our probabilities are going to end up being more spread out. We're less confident about the, the knowledge of where our variables should live. Um, and that's just representative of our lack of information. We're, we're going to say we have a more broad spread of all of our possible outcomes here. Um, and we're stating that as, in a sense, of saying, listen, we don't know as much as we used to know when we knew sigma and we had a normal distribution. We don't have that now. So that's going to spread out our probabilities to say we're a little bit less confident about uh, the, the outcomes that we're going to see. Um, so last paragraph, I know this is too many words on the screen right here. We're going to get a really nice picture in a second. So. Um, the whole reason our sample averages follow a different distribution is due to lack of population information, right? So the reason that we're kind of transitioning away from the standard normal Z distribution, our normal distribution, um, into a T distribution is because we don't quite have as much information. We only have information about the sample. However, what you should then be realizing is that our sample can be any size, right? We could take very small samples or we could take huge samples. If we take very, very large samples, then our sample statistics like S and X bar, they are going to get very, very, very close to our population parameters, sigma and mu. So a thing that we should also see is that our T distribution is going to change shape as our sample size gets larger or gets smaller, I guess you could say. And as our T distribution gets a larger and larger and larger sample size, its shape is going to much more closely resemble that of a normal distribution. Because if you, sh you should be thinking to yourself, if we take a sample that is the entire population size, if N is the size of the population, then we've just taken a census. We actually do know the entire population's information. We truly know mu and sigma at that point. So it should be the case that as our sample size gets larger and larger, the T distribution approaches just being the normal distribution. But it's a little bit different for small sample sizes, and that's very typically the case in which we're using the T distribution here. Um, so here's our nice picture of the T distribution that I found on the internet. So let's talk about this real quick here. Um, so the first thing that I want you to see here is that this curve that's in black is our standard normal distribution. This is where I feel like they should be capitalizing that N right there for normal. Standard normal, meaning that this is our 0, 1 distribution right here. This is us saying our standard normal is our normal distribution with an average of 0. You can see the average of 0 right there and a standard deviation of 1. And that's the standard normal distribution here. What you can see is that all or the two T distributions and in blue and in red are similar to a bell-shaped curve, but they're a little bit more squash. They're flattened down a bit. They're spread out. The probability is more spread out, acknowledging the fact that we don't quite know as much about the distribution of this variable as we do when we're in an actual true normal situation, where we truly do know the actual standard deviation of the population. That's information we don't have here, and our lack of information is represented by a spreading of our probabilities out there to say we're a little bit less confident about where our values actually live. The other thing that you should be noticing over here is this phrasing that we haven't seen before this semester, this mention of degrees of freedom. Fortunately, this is a really easy thing for us to handle here. Uh, degrees of freedom are really easy. To measure your degrees of freedom, it's always just one less than your sample size. So when we see a distribution with 10 degrees of freedom, that just means that this was from a sample size of 11. When we see a distribution of 20 degrees of freedom, this is just going to tell us that our sample size was 21 right there. So degrees of freedom is just off by one from our sample size. Size. 
think that describing what a degree of freedom is trying to measure is difficult to do right now. Later this semester, we're going to run across a different distribution for a different hypothesis test, because we're doing basically these for the rest of the semester, um, where there were, it's going to be much more easy for me to explain to you how to like think about what a degree of freedom is. So I'm basically just going to say, just hang on for a while. Just recognize that a degree of freedom is the simplest subtraction problem of all time. It's just one less than your sample size right there for your degrees of freedom. And this is relevant information for any T distribution. Any T distribution is typically just denoted as a uh, as just how many degrees of freedom it has. So notice in general, we write statements that look like this. The variable X is distributed normally with an average of zero and a standard deviation of one. It's typical for us to write for our T distributions that capital T is distributed according to the T distribution with, and then as a subscript, like degrees of freedom down there. So that might be our like 10 or something like that. So we might say here that T is distributed according to the T distribution with uh, 10 degrees of freedom. That would be like our notation indicating this guy right here. Um, and we might have our, our, mu, our mu and our S uh, maybe as an optional thing right there, but it's often just given just describing the degrees of freedom right here. So an important thing to notice here is this. The T distribution, there's actually like an infinite number of different T distributions out there, all depending on how many degrees of freedom that you have. There's only one standard normal distribution. You're looking at it. It's right there. It's the black curve. There are uh, any number of T distributions, all for the different number of degrees of freedom that we have. When we have a very small number of degrees of freedom, we're going to get bell-shaped curves that are very, very low and flat, tons of area in the tails. As our n value increases, as our degrees of freedom increase, we're going to see the distribution shape up more and more and more to the point where notice that they're saying that a standard normal distribution, they're drawing an arrow to the black curve, is the exact same thing as a t distribution with infinite degrees of freedom because that basically means our sample size was everything, right? Now, we're never sampling an infinite number of things, but I at least like to think. Um, if we sample all of the population, if we performed a census, then there is no distinction between what we know from our sample and what we know from our population. If you performed a, a census, the sample was the entire population. That's the definition of a census. You snagged the, everybody. You didn't miss anybody out there, right? So a T distribution, as the number of degrees of freedom gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the shape of the T distribution gets closer and closer and closer to matching that of just the original normal distribution that we're used to working with already. So further good news about the T distribution is that all of our calculations that we're going to do with it are going to match the normal distribution calculations exactly. We just need to very importantly acknowledge that the T distribution is slightly different. It's got a little bit more area in the tails. Notice over here, if I kind of draw one arbitrary line out here, like we were looking at our P values yesterday, you should notice that there's only a very small amount of area underneath the black curve right here. But there's a much larger amount of area underneath the red and blue curves out in this tail out here. And this is, in a sense, saying to us, if we want to see small p-values so that we can reject our null hypothesis, we need to see more extreme results when we use our t-distribution because we know less information about the sample. So the t-distribution is doing a very good job of preventing us from overstating what we know. The t-distribution is going to require, in a sense, a slightly stronger uh, bit of evidence from us for us to reject our previous hypothesis. But that's good because if we're using the t-distribution, it's because we don't know as much about the sample. We don't know our standard deviation, sigma. And because we have less information, we want to be a little bit more cautious in our claims. That's ultimately represented by having more area in our tails out here than we would otherwise experience with the normal distribution. Um, so here's just a couple paragraphs saying exactly these things. Notice that when n is small, the distribution is lower and flatter. When n gets large, the distribution shapes up to be normal. Uh, we learned in the last video that small p-values, small tail areas, are associated with rejecting our null hypothesis. Notice that we need to experience more extreme t-values, more ex uh, extreme t-scores. We Just like we had z-scores yesterday, we'll have t-scores today. Um, for us to experience that same small probability, to experience that same ability to reject that null hypothesis. This, again, says, since we don't know much about the population, we need to see even more extreme results for us to be convinced that we should be rejecting the null hypothesis here. So, um, 
This idea kind of agrees with our intuition that we, the more information we have, the stronger claims we can make. The T distribution is our admission that we don't know as much, and therefore it's tough for us to make those stronger claims. We need to see more extreme results to get those tiny areas in the tails out there, those small P values. So let's go ahead and see this in action. Let's just go through an example, even though I haven't given you technically our computation updates here. We'll get those on the fly. And again, for our T distribution, very little is going to change relative to our Z distribution. It's just that our calculations and our areas are different. So we need to make sure that we're thinking about T land thoughts rather than Z land thoughts when appropriate. So let's look at this example here. <laughs> this is my, uh, my wife uh, uh, makes fun of my, my family and I for us about being the big heads. We all have huge heads. We can never find collared shirts that actually appropriately fit our necks. I got to wear like two XLs when I get dress shirts because otherwise I can't get a button around my neck to wear a tie, but then I'm wearing like a tent. Um, so average head circumference for adult males, I looked this up, is about 58 centimeters. My wife uh, regularly observes that the males in my family seem to have larger heads than that. So we're going to hypothetically say that over some Christmas vacation when all my family gets together, we decide to test that claim, measure, every, measure all the males' head circumferences and see if they're really bigger. The head circumference of the 11 males in my family are measured with a resulting mean of 59.3 centimeters and a standard deviation of 2.2 centimeters. Is my wife justified in her claim? All right, so this is what we're going to kind of attempt to justify here with, uh, with the hypothesis test, right? We've been given information about a sample, and we want to use that sample information to judge, is this really like a legitimate difference, or is this just sampling error, right? And we saw the same question yesterday, and I, I almost included it, but I didn't write it out right here. Again, what we saw yesterday is that just because the true population is 58 centimeters doesn't mean that I'm expecting my family's average head circumference to also be 58 centimeters. We know there's always variation when you collect a sample. It would be, in fact, very weird to me if we collected a sample from my family and we found exactly 58 centimeters. That would be really unusual to me to perfectly match it. Every sample probably has a little bit of natural variation to it. So to me, I'm not really convinced that this 59.3 centimeter sample necessarily really represents us actually having bigger heads than average. Maybe this is just my one giant headed uncle dragging that average out there. I don't know. Um, and so again, the point is we always expect to see a little bit of variation. Do we just attribute this variation to just variation in sampling or should we be attributing this variation to truly experiencing a different uh, head size in this subset of the population that represents the males in my family, right? So again, there's always going to be a little difference between mu and x bar, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's a true difference that we're experiencing. We want to know, is the difference statistically significant, or is it just a difference that probably maybe just arose due to variation in sampling out there? So let's go through some of the questions that we asked yesterday. I've kind of trimmed these down a little bit, but we're still doing the exact same process here. So what information do we know? Let's go through all the numbers out here and talk about the things that we see. 58 centimeters, average head circumference for adult males is 58 centimeters. This is a broad claim about all adult males. This is population information. So our mu here is the 58 centimeters. This is a population piece of information. Uh, the next number that I see is 11 males in my family. This is the sample that we're taking. So it looks like our sample size is 11. Um, in which, by the way, I'm just going to write it right, well, okay, no, I'm not, wait, oh, come on, dude, I don't know why I can't, oh, it used to be just fine, the first 10 videos I did this year, it would just undo just the line, just the last thing I wrote, and now I get entire lines deleted all the time, okay, so, sample size is 11. Uh, from my family, right? Now, it's very important that we're able to like read right here. We have to be able to read these paragraphs and really interpret what these numbers are actually talking about. When we sampled the 11 males in my family, these two pieces of information seem to directly be about the sample that was drawn, not the overall population. So when I say with a resulting mean of 59.3, that means that the X bar was 59.3 centimeters. And, and a standard deviation of 2.2. The super important thing that we're identifying today is that this 2.2 is not sigma. This is not the entire population standard deviation. This is just the standard deviation 
abbreviation of what we observed in the 11 members of my family. That's it. So this is not sigma. That's the whole crux of this entire example is that 2.2 is a standard deviation, but it is not the population standard deviation. It is the sample standard deviation. So that's where the 2.2 goes is with S, not sigma. Right, that, that's really critical for this whole thing here. If it was the case that we knew that uh, what the standard deviation of uh, circumference for adult males is, then we'd be using that piece of information, we'd be calling it sigma, and we'd be back to doing Z type stuff like we did last video. In this case, we don't know what the population standard deviation is. The best thing that we have available for us is only this little piece of information about just the standard deviation of just 11 people. Because this is a very small sample here, we are going to have to use a slightly different distribution to describe the probabilities associated with our results. Um, so before we move on to our doing our actual hypothesis test of computing these things, you should notice relative to yesterday, there is one difference here. I don't know why I'm working on all this scrolling over here. I've got this stuff on the side. Okay, let me just get to my the questions we're actually asking over here. Um, so one thing that's importantly missing from this setup statement that you're seeing over here is that I never said an alpha value. I never said what our weirdness cutoff is, right? What is how, how unusual of a sample do I really need to see for my wife to feel justified in making her claim? And I importantly left that out here because we just want to talk about this one. Um, what's not always the case is you're not always given an alpha value. And it's important that sometimes we make judgments as to what size alpha value is going to be appropriate for a given type of test. So here's the way that I like to think about this. If you are like a biologist or if you are like a chemist and you're trying to come up with like, uh, you know, a cancer treatment drug or something like that, it really matters that you're correct when you claim that that drug is going to like reduce cancer rates or increase lifespan or something like that. It really matters that you're correct. Our null hypothesis for those types of scenarios is always going to be that there is no effect from taking the drug. It's the statement of no change is always our null hypothesis. If we're going to overrule that null hypothesis, reject it and say this drug does have an impact on, on our, our cancer rates, on our survivability, stuff like that, then we need to be very certain that our drug trials show that that's true. It's a, we need to make a very strong claim. We need to see events that very strongly reject the idea that there is no difference when you take that drug. And so what I need to see is a very extreme result on our normal distributions. I want to see a very small area in that tail out there for me to be very sure that there actually is a true experience, uh, a change being experienced by the people that are taking that cancer drug there. So it's typically the case that if you very much are, are if this is a, if it really matters if you're right or not with a significance test, we always want to have then very, very small alpha values. It's a very difficult threshold to get over and it makes sure that we're right, right? We don't want to go making frivolous claims if we're talking about like cancer treatment drugs, right? So very tiny alpha values or alpha values are associated with difficult claims to prove. On the other hand, if we're just making claims of my wife making fun of my family and I, uh, you know, it's not that serious of a claim, right? The, the, the risks associated with these errors are very small and in fact negligible because she's just going to make fun of my family whether she's correct or not about this. I just, this is more for me. I want to know if my wife should be allowed to make fun of my family for us all having big heads out there, right? So the point here is I don't think we need to experience too extreme of a result here for my wife to be justified in her answer right here is basically the deal. Um, so let me just say this. Uh, our very typical alpha values to experience are alpha equals 0.01, alpha equals 0.05, and alpha equals 0.1. I will state a joke that I was told once by a statistics professor about these. The joke was that an alpha level of 0.01 is for science because we need to be really sure. This is a very difficult threshold to cross. You have to have a p-value smaller than 0.01, right? Our area in our tails needs to be tiny out there. So we need to see really extreme events to get us to that tiny area in the tail out there. So alpha value of 0.01 goes to science. Alpha value of 0.05 goes with business. Alpha value of 0.1 goes with government. Um, it's, it's a bit of a like government joke right there from that guy. Uh, but the point being, it's like, how, how much do you really care that you're right in the decisions that you're making? Scientists need to be really sure. Business people need to be pretty sure. Uh, and the joke is that the government doesn't need to be very sure. It's a joke. Shouldn't make jokes near to an election time right now. Anyway, the point is here, um, difficult threshold to get over. 
serious claims. Down here, this is an easier threshold to get over. This is saying we only need to see an event that's extreme enough that leaves just less than 10% or 0.1, 10% of the area in a tail, and that would be extreme enough for us to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. So this says you don't need to see as extreme of a results if alpha is 0.1 for you to reject the null hypothesis and go with your alternative hypothesis claim. So I think in this scenario here, uh, since this is all just about my wife's ability to make fun of my family, this is not a very serious claim. And so I'm thinking here, this is a place where I think an awful value of 0.1 is more appropriate. Where we're saying, I don't need to see that extreme of a result for me to be justified in rejecting the idea that my family has normal sized heads in favor of the idea that my family has extra large sized heads out here. So let's set up our hypotheses that say exactly that for us, right? Our null hypothesis is our statement of no change or no difference. And here, the no difference would mean my family's average head size has no difference from the general populations, in which case we would say uh, that our the average head size in my family truly is going to be 58 or centimeters out there, not inches. Our alternative claim here, my wife, what she believes is true, what we think we're going to show is that average head size within my family is in fact greater than 58 centimeters out here, right? So our ter alternative hypothesis is a one-tailed right-tail test. Remember, as we saw in the previous video, this impacts where we're looking in our distribution for the area that we accumulate to call the p-value, right? So, um, and by the way, notice here that I've trimmed down our statements from yesterday down to just the four essential components of a hypothesis test. We always will start by forming our hypotheses. We will then compute our test statistic from the statistics from the sample. We will use the test statistic to compute a p-value. We will uh, compare the p-value to our alpha value to decide if we reject uh, the null hypothesis or not and form our conclusion statement. So these four parts are really the essential four parts of any hypothesis test right here. So let's go ahead and compute a test statistic. Um, and let me, I'm probably going to need to do myself a little bit more room here. Um, that's not, uh, what do you, okay, here we go, here we go. Um, with sigma known, right, this is what we did in the last video. If sigma was known, then we computed our test statistic as z equals x bar minus mu over sigma over root n. The only difference that we're now going to do is we're going to say with sigma unknown, we are going to do the exact same computation and we're just going to call it a different letter. Our t value, our t test statistic is still going to be how far was our average from the population average. It's still going to be divided by what we think of as our square root term divided by square root of, or sorry, our standard deviation term over root n. It's just that sigma is now s. It's the literal only difference that's happening here. Um, so this should be pretty easy for us to do the exact same computation. I'm gonna go hit this up in Excel just like we did uh, last video here. So let's go ahead and uh, enter in all this information that we have uh, gathered over here. So I'm gonna scroll back up so I can see it. I'm trying to input this information here into Excel and we're gonna do that so we can compute our T test statistic. Yesterday we computed Z scores for Z test statistics. Today we're gonna compute T scores for T test statistics because we don't know the true population standard deviation. So what do we got here? I know that mu is 58. I know that our sample size is 11. I know that my X bar, my, uh, my sample average is 59.3. I know that my S, I don't know sigma, but I do know S, my sample standard deviation was 2.2. I can compute my standard error term, just like we've been doing. Our standard error term was before sigma over root n. It's now S over root n. So in this case, I wanna do S, which is C5, S, divided by the square root of n, which is C3, right? So I'm doing C5, uh, over the square root of C3 there to get S over the square root of N, just to get my standard error term. Uh, we can see that before we had a sample standard deviation of 2.2, when we divide by the square root of 11, a much smaller standard error term. We expect that when we take groups of 11 people on average, it's gonna be harder for them to deviate from the mean than just one person. 
So now we can compute our uh, T score here, our T test statistic. This should be X bar minus mu, and that gives me C4 minus C2, according to my Excel chart right here, X bar minus mu, divided by our standard error term, S over root N. I could do this as S over root N, but I've already computed what that should be. That should be the value that I already have right sitting there in C6. So this says to me, according to my T distribution, we are 1.96 standard deviations away from average, about two standard deviations away. But remember, this is not a normal distribution anymore. If you're thinking your thoughts about like the empirical rule with uh, like our 68, 95, 99.7 rule, those don't apply here. Those apply to the normal distribution. We are looking at a T distribution, so that's a little different, right? We're not gonna get quite the same probabilities. They're gonna be close, but they're not gonna be the same. So what am I seeing out here? I guess I should just fill this in. I guess we're getting like a 1.960 right there. Um, and again, don't over round on these guys. Stick it out to a couple decimal places. Even though that one's zero, including that zero makes me know, helps me communicate to other people that I did keep three decimal places of accuracy here. It's just that the third decimal place was zero. So even if it is a zero right there, like this does round to 1.960 right there. Including that zero tells me that we do know one more decimal level of precision right there. So even if it's zero, it's good to include these things. I'd say go at least three decimal places on these guys. So we now want to compute a p-value that's associated with this guy, but what we're recognizing is that we're not actually a normal distribution anymore. And I'm going to draw my really lame curve right there that's very poorly uh, it wasn't supposed to be a normal distribution anyway. It's a T distribution. This is our T distribution. I know that I had a sample size of 11, and so that tells me that I have 10 degrees of freedom here. And I know from my alternative hypothesis that we are interested in the probability that our average is greater than this proposed average, our null hypothesized value of 58. So we are interested in performing this upper tailed test up here. I know that I have this T value of 1.96. That's the test statistic that we computed. What we want to know is how much area is out here in this tail. That's our p-value right there. So the good news for us is that we're while we're not using our normal distribution, we're not going to go do a norm.dist in Excel right now. We're going to do the next closest thing, and we're just going to do t.dist. It's not changing that much. We're talking about a t distribution. We want to get probabilities from it. We're going to follow basically the same steps right here. So there's really not much variation in what we're seeing right here. So to get our p-value now, we're interested in computing a probability from a T distribution with 10 degrees of freedom. So I'm going to go ask for a T distribution calculation in Excel right now. So I'm going to type in T dot. And again, I've told you guys this a bunch of times before. As you start typing, as you guys know in Excel, if you're using Excel, as soon as you hit equals and start typing, there's a big old drop down menu. I'm hovering over right now like a whole list of stuff right here. And the very top one says, t.dist right here. It's exactly the same type of uh, calculations that we've been doing before. All the things that we've done with norm so far in Excel, you can do all of the exact same things with dist. There's all the, all the same calculations are out there because we're looking at a lot of these same scenarios. It's still this vaguely bell-shaped curve. It's technically not bell-shaped in the same sense that the normal distribution is, but pretty dang close. So anyway, all of our intuition carries over here. We just have a technically a different formula to compute this problem, this area out here, but we're not even dealing with the formulas ourselves in these classes. We're having the technology deal with the formula for us. So all we have to do is just acknowledge that this is a T scenario and then basically do the same stuff. So the T distribution is going to ask for a slightly different information right here. I'll write out what it actually is right here. Let me say the probability that our T value is greater than 1.96. What I'm going to do here is a T dot dist. It's always, uh, one thing that bothers me is they write X right there when to me that should be T because it should be our T value right there. Um, what are the next things that they're looking for? It's X, degrees of freedom, and cumulative. X, degree of freedom, and cumulative. So I am going to type in exactly that information here. I'm going to do t.dist. Uh, I really hate that they're using X right there. It should be our test statistic, the T value, the 1.96. Uh, my degrees of freedom in this case is 10 because that's one less than my sample size. Um, this is really n minus 1. 
This is really our T-score. Right, that guy right there. Cumulative, as usual, always true. So 1.96, 10, and true. Oh, and by the way, since this is greater than, I forgot my, my one minuses in here. We're doing an upper tail, so I need to make sure I do one minus that value to get the upper tail's probability instead. So let's come over here and actually throw this all in here now. So I'm going to get one minus because it's an upper tail. T dot dist. My T score was the 1.96. My degrees of freedom in this case is 10. It needs to know which T distribution we're talking about. I'm talking about the one with 10 degrees of freedom. And true, always for our cumulative statement right there. And what I do, double parentheses myself? Yeah. And so it's giving us this p-value right here of 0 0.039218. So what this says to me is this. If it really were true that my family's average head size was the same as the 58 centimeters of the general population, if that were true, then this sample that we've drawn would only occur 3.9% of the time out here. Right? That's a very unlikely event. That's more unlikely than our unlikeliness threshold that we have right up here. We decided that this would be appropriate for like an alpha value of 0.1. We got a p-value that's less than that. We got an event that is more rare than our rareness cutoff for acceptability of keeping the null hypothesis. Therefore, since our p-value is less than our alpha value, we are going to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So our decision or our conclusion here is, I'm gonna say p-value 0.39 is less than alpha, which is 0.1, and that tells us reject h naught. That's my decision. My conclusion, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to maybe type out my conclusion. It's a little bit more of a paragraph style. Um, at the alpha equals 0.1 level of significance. How significant is our result? All right, that's what we're kind of stating right there. We crossed that threshold. Uh, our data were significant. They did show not just technically a difference, but a meaningful difference. I know that because my p-value was 0 0.039, I'll abbreviate a little bit right there. We reject the null hypothesis and conclude that average head size head circumference, I should be specific, in my family in the males in my family, in the adult males in my family, is larger than the general population. All right, so here we saw that the sample information did cross us over that threshold right there. If the p-value is less than the alpha value, that is when we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. That says that the event that we experienced, our sample, was so rare that we think it's more likely that the null hypothesis was wrong than that we just happened to get a rare sample. That's what we're saying when we reject the null hypothesis. We're saying we think the p-value is so unlikely, this represents such an unlikely sample, that it's more likely that the null hypothesis was wrong than that we just happened to get that unusual sample by chance in the one sample that we took. So let's kind of briefly recap what we just saw right here. Everything's the same. The only thing that's really truly different is you need to recognize in the setup for the problem that the standard deviation being given to you, you have to ask yourself now for the next for all the time that we do these tests right here, is that standard deviation from the sample or is it from the population? In this case, the standard deviation was from the sample and therefore we did a t-test. If the standard deviation given to us was from the entire population, if this was known like the population information for the average up here, then in that case, we would go ahead and do the z-test like we did yesterday. We would have computed a z-test statistic. We would have done norm.dist over here to get our probabilities. That's really the only thing that changed. So recognize that the only stuff that's different here today is we called our variable a t instead of a z 
and then we use the t distribution instead of the normal distribution to compute our associated probabilities. That's all that changed here. Um, one tiny other difference that changed here, this is just a computational difference. Remember that yesterday when we did our p-value computations, I did it once using x information and once using z information. Uh, and we got the exact same answer. I just wanted to show you that it worked both ways. In this case here for the t distribution, Excel does not offer us a way to just do this with the like raw information of like the 58 and the 2.2 and stuff like that. It will only take in a t score, like the 1.96. So we saw yesterday that technically we could skip this step and just give it essentially this information and it would kind of take, take us from our statistics directly to the p value without computing a test statistic in between. For the t-step, we have to get the test statistic in between. We're sort of treating this like it's a z-score. This is a number of standard deviations, but it's a number of standard deviations in a different distribution than the normal distribution. A vaguely different one, but a different one. Right? So really the only thing that's different is we use t instead of z and norm in this example because the standard deviation came from the sample, not from the whole population. That's the only difference right here, all right? So not a big dif difference to make right there, but it is going to give us different types of probabilities. Um, so, um, and in fact, let me just do one thing here real quick. Uh, the wrong p-value here, if we did norm.dist, then this would be wanting to take in, what, what, what? oh, I just gotta do equals, equals norm.dist. This would be wanting to take in my x value of 59.3, my mean of 58, my standard deviation. If I'm claiming that 2.2 is the population standard deviation, which isn't true, then that's what I'd throw in right there. So here I'm giving it the norm.dist. I'm using the wrong uh, distribution here to calculate this. And what I wanna kind of show you is that up in this picture up here, what we're seeing is that if I were to consider this to instead be my Z value instead of a T value right here, you should see that we're gonna get, if we use our normal distribution, the black curve, we're gonna get a much smaller P value than we would have gotten if we used the blue or red curve. In fact, we were the red curve exactly. And in this example, we had a sample size of 11, 10 degrees of freedom. So in our example that we just did, we should be using the red curve to compute our probability. If we erroneously used the black curve to compute our probability, I'm expecting to get a smaller answer for the P value, right? We just computed the area underneath the red curve from this bar to the right. And you can see it's kind of a larger chunk of area. You can see that under the black curve to the right is a much smaller area. So I expect over here when I hit enter that I'm going to get a much smaller P value than I experienced in the previous setup right there. Um, wait, what? What did I what did I type in wrong here? Uh, now now what am I doing for weird? Oh, I'm using I did the same thing as yesterday. I didn't use the correct standard error term right there. Um, this 2.2 should have been what's in uh, cell C6 right there. That's what I should I I did the same wrong thing as I did in the last video right there. And so I was correct in what I stated here a second ago. I'm seeing a smaller p value when I do this the wrong way because here I'm looking at this smaller area under the black curve instead of this larger area underneath the red curve. So you can see that if you use the norm.dist instead of the t.dist, you're going to get incorrect results for the amount of area that is associated with this, meaning you're going to get incorrect results as to how likely that sample was. And if you don't know how likely a sample was, then you can't make a judgment as to whether or not that sample was unlikely enough to cross our alpha threshold. So it matters that we do the correct uh, distribution with our computations here, we will get incorrect p-values. Uh, in general, we'll always get smaller p-values than we should if we use the norm instead of the t, um, because the normal distribution is always the more shaped up one with less area in the tails out there. All right, so that's our wrong p-value right there. So I hope that that's clear that that's incorrect right here. Um, that the correct p-value is this guy right there, the 0 0.039. So what have we seen? So far, what we've seen is two different tests. We've seen a one sample test for a population mean, right? We keep on testing against the mu, our population mean, our population average. We looked yesterday at when we did know the entire population standard deviation, but that's generally pretty rare. We refer to these as a Z test because we use the standard normal distribution to compute the probability of seeing the sample that we saw. So to get our probabilities, we use the Z distribution. And so therefore this is called a Z test.
what we just updated our information to is the second one right here. It's still a one sample test. We're still just collecting one single sample. We're still trying to measure the validity of a statement about the population mean, mu, but in these cases, we didn't know sigma. We only actually knew s, our sample standard deviation. In this case, it's more appropriate for us to use the t distribution to measure the probabilities of seeing events that are like that, and therefore this is referred to as a t-test. So the only difference between these two is using a very slightly different distribution and recognizing, did our standard deviation come from the entire population? If so, use a z-test. If it only came from the sample, then go ahead and use a t-test. But as you saw, like not a big difference in our computations, right? Our test statistics are still comp computed essentially identically. We just swapped out one standard deviation term for the other. Our computations in Excel and in your calculator are going to be almost identical to what they were previously. They're just associated with a T distribution instead of a normal distribution is the only difference out there. So you just got to remember to use the correct uh, technology computations there. So what else do we still have coming up here? Well, we still have a one sample test for a population proportion, which we're about to do right now. Uh, coming up, we're going to compare across two populations. We're going to say things like, um, on average, men are two inches taller than women. We want to test this claim in a population. We collect a sample from 30 men and from 45 women. Uh, we found the difference in their heights to be blank. Does this show a statistically significant difference? Yes or no? So a two sample test is going to compare across two, the difference across two groups. Um, it's not otherwise going to change that much. It's still going to have a very, very similar form to everything we've been doing, but we'll just compare two samples instead of one samples. There are going to be some other ones that are going to come up this semester, but I, as, as I started making this bulleted list, I was like, man, I really can't describe those concisely in one line in the bulleted list. So I'm going to hold off. But the point is, <clears throat> we still do have several other hypothesis test scenarios coming up. We're going to test against standard deviations. We're going to test against uh, distributions, entire distribution. Are our values distributed the way that we we think that they should be yes or no and it'll be one that uh, we get later as well out here so there are going to be a, a bunch more uh, hypothesis tests that we're going to do here this semester um, there's only three that are associated with this chapter this chapter gives us the z test which we already did it gives us the t test which we just did just now and we're going to get our prop test our proportion test right now so let's go ahead and take a look at this example and we'll call it a day so one sample test for a population proportion. This is our third and final hypothesis test associated with chapter nine and our abbreviation for it will be a prop test, just like we have a Z test and a T test. So let's uh, move on to our next example here. Um, in our next example, we're gonna talk about some polling data here. Um, and so here's our scenario. A statewide poll suggests that 40% of the voting public support a certain candidate for public office. That's across the entire state. The officials, the, the public officials campaign manager would like to determine in which towns that that candidate is experiencing lower support than the statewide average so that they can target their campaigning efforts in those towns. So a poll is conducted in a town. Uh, they have 56 people if they support the candidate and 21 say that they do support the candidate. What we would like to know is that does that represent a statistically significant difference from that 40%? Are they supporting this candidate at a noticeably lower rate than the rest of the state or not? At the alpha equal 0.05 level of significance, does this town experience a low, lower level of support for the candidate than the state as a whole, right? And so again, this whole level of significance thing is saying, it's not going to be the case. It's just not gonna be the case that we're gonna get exactly 40% in this town. It's incredibly unlikely that that happens. We might see a 39%, we might see a 41%. We don't necessarily think that those are meaningful differences, not statistically significant differences out there. Those are just differences in variability of the sample that we drew, right? If we see a bigger and bigger difference, that might become more and more representative of a true difference that we would want to actually acknowledge in which the campaign would then want to follow up on. Right? So let's see how this is going to be different. Notice here that we're talking not about an average. There's a no averages that are computed in this entire thing right here. We do have a percentage and percentages are proportions. So we're looking at talking about is the proportion of voters in this town same as the 40% statewide or they're worried about whether or not it's going to be lower than that in this town right here. So what information were we given? Well, in this problem here, we are given the population proportion, which we denote as P. And we can see here that the population proportion is 40%, which we write as a decimal as 0.4. The remaining information that we are given is about a sample, right? That was our population information. Our sample information that we are given here, 
is we were given, let's see, they asked 56 people, so the sample size was 56. Uh, 21 successes, right? We had x equals 21 successes, yeses. All right, what we need to do here is we want to know is the proportion of our sample less than the proportion of the state at a significant, at a statistically significant level. So what we need still here is we need to use this information to compute a sample proportion that we can compare against the population proportion. So we're going to get here that p hat. So just like we have x bar, we have p hat. p hat is going to be our sample proportion, and that's just always our number of successes divided by our sample size. In this case, 21 divided by 56. And what is 21 divided by 56? I've got my calculator here. 21 divided by 56 is 0.375. So this says, of the people polled, 37.5% of them said that they support the candidate right there. It is technically true that that is less than 0.4, but we don't know if it's really a meaningful difference. We only sampled 56 people. That's not really that far from 40%. Let's go ahead and do a... Uh, a, a hypothesis test to see if this truly is a variation from our uh, a statistically significant deviation from our population proportion. So this is our sample proportion here. So what we need to know is how are our sample proportions distributed, right? Um, what we've seen is that when we went from uh, When we had that x was normal, we had a mu and a sigma as our descriptors. But then we upgraded this to talk about our distribution of sample averages so that we could talk about our uh, our distribution of results for our samples, right? That helped us do our computations associated with saying, is this sample unusual? Because we're not talking about individuals, we're talking about entire samples. So we need to know how samples are distributed to know how abnormal a sample is. And what we're seeing here is we're getting things like sigma over root n, right? What our situation is now is that when you are sampling one individual person to see do you support the candidate or not, that is a single yes, no question, right? This is, so this stuff over there is z-test, t-test for averages. What we're interested in is a prop test for proportions. What I know is that our original variable was a binomial variable with a probability of 0.4, right? Um, and so when we are looking at an individual, um, Let's just, I guess we should say this as uh, x is distributed binomially. And remember that we get an n and a p in here. This n is going to be the 56. That's our sample size. Our p, our probability of success, that is the claimed 0.4 right there. Right? What we want to know, though, is not how one is distributed. We want to know how... Um, like one sample is distributed. We want to know how all the samples are just sorry We don't want to know how one person's probability is going to be judged. We want to know how an entire sample uh, Is going to be judged here. We want to know is this an unlikely sample or not? So we need to know how samples are distributed are distributed What we're gonna find from our central limit theorem is that because we are taking samples of more than 30 people here it doesn't matter that the underlying distribution is not normal we are going to find our sample distribution for the sample proportion p hat to be normal and it's going to follow uh, our our similar distribution information here um, associated what we with what we knew for the average and the standard deviation for the binomial distribution um, and so let me just say here average was NP our standard deviation was the square root of NPQ. <clears throat> and so what we're going to do here is we're going to use exactly this information. We know the average value of a binomial variable is NP, and I'm looking for the average value of the sample that I expect to experience out here. It had better just be NP, 
The other thing that we want to recognize is that if the standard deviation associated with an individual was the square root of NPQ, what we've seen over here is this division by the square root of N going on here. Really, this is a division by N because this is a variance term. We divided by N and then took a square root of it. This is really an overall division by N going on. We've just square rooted it after the fact. Here, if we divide this guy by N, we're going to get that the square root of NPQ over N is really going to be like, uh, you can think of this as the square root of n times the square root of pq over, this is really the square root of n times the square root of n on the bottom because the square root of n squared is just n. And you can see that we're going to get those guys are going to cancel, leaving us just with this root pq over n. Alright, so. This is our very important information right here that tells us how do we compute probabilities associated with proportions, uh, sample proportions out there. So that box is really, really, really important for us in this case right here. Man, I didn't give myself anywhere near enough room. Let me just delete this and move it down. So in our case here then, we are going to experience that our uh, for our information here, we're going to have that our proportions are distributed normally. N times P for us is going to be our 56 times our 0.4. 56 times 0.4 is 22.4. So that's saying we would expect to get 22.4 successes. We had 21 successes, a little bit below that, right? And this root PQ over N, that looks to me like the square root of our P here was 0.4. Q is always the complement of P, so it's 1 minus 0.4, it'll be 0.6. And this is all divided by N, which in our case was 56 right there. So let's go ahead and throw this guy into the calculator here. 0.4 times 0.6 over 56. 0.4 times 0.6 divided by 56, and we'll take the square root of that guy, and I'm getting a 0 0.0655. All right, so now we can go ahead and use this information to help us judge was this an unusual sample or not here. Um, Sorry, one second real quick here. Let me take it off. Okay, I, I'm looking this up because I feel like I'm doing a dumb thing right now, and I am doing a dumb thing right now, and I, I'm, I'm fixing this right now. Um, what is our expected value for, uh, the, the, what I'm doing dumb right now is that I'm not interested in this, this NP right here. This is just going to be P. This is, our, this is our estimate for what we think our, our distribution should be centered at. Our distribution should be centered at this probability of 40% right there. I was like, well, am I writing something dumb in here? And I definitely am. So I'm going to go ahead and scratch out this information right here. And I'm going to be smart. And I'm going to actually just use my eraser right here and get rid of these guys. This is to say, how should our samples be distributed? They should be distributed such that the average proportion that we see is 40%. That's our average proportion. This is how much standard deviation we expect to see in a sample of size 56 right there. So sorry, that was me being a little bit dumb right there. Um, I now have my appropriate estimate in there for p hat. Our, again, p hat is our sample proportion. 
we think that the average, if we were to go take a whole bunch of samples from a bunch of different places and average the proportion that we get, we should get 40% overall because that's what the statewide average support is for this candidate here. Um, so now that I'm being less crazy here, oh no, I'm back in that mode again. Oh man, not allowed to type anymore. Okay, I'm allowed to type once again. I wish I knew how, what controlled that. So let's go ahead and actually use this information now. This is gonna be our guiding distribution to help us out here. We know we follow a normal distribution, so we'll get to use our norm information. We've got our average and standard deviate or our standard error here. So this is now our average and our standard error. So let's state our hypothesis. Let's just do our test now. We've got our hypotheses, test statistic, p-value, decision conclusion. This is the hypothesis test on one screen right here. All right. So let's state our hypotheses. Our statement of no change here would be that the proportion of voters supporting this candidate in this town um, are going to be equal to 0.4, right? That's our, our, our claim here, is that in this town, the voter support is exactly the same as what it is in the state. It's our statement of no change. Right? What we are suspicious might be true. The reason that they are polling this town is to see if the proportion is in fact less than 0.4. They're wondering, do we need to go and do some like extra campaigning in this town because the support is a little bit lower right there or not, right? So they're suspicious that we have less than 40% support for the candidate. That's our alternative hypothesis. For our test statistic here, because our, pop, our sampling distribution of the sample proportion is normally distributed, we are using a Z test statistic here. So Z is going to be our, so before for averages, we had X bar minus mu over sigma over root N. We are now going to have for proportions, basically the same thing. It's our, it's still a Z value. We're going to get our, our, uh, I lose my words here. We're going to use our, instead of our sample average, our sample proportion. So what was the sample proportion that we got? That was the 0.375. We're going to subtract that. Oh, sorry. I'm not going to, don't you do it to me. Yeah. We're going to use our sample proportion. That's P hat minus our population proportion. That's just P. And we're going to divide this guy by our standard error, which we saw as uh, root PQ over root n and i'm writing it slightly different than before instead of just square root pq over n this is the same thing by the way I didn't, let me just say this square root pq over square root n is the same thing as the square root of pq over n is the same thing as the square root of p times one minus p over n lots of different ways we could write the same thing right here i'm just trying to write it in this way so that you see that this formulation identically matches this one over here right we're still getting the sample minus the population divided by the standard error. That's still the same structure of our computation. So what do we got here? 0.375 minus 0.4 divided by, and we just computed our standard error up here as 0 0.0655. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna fill all this out in Excel right now, since I should responsibly do that. Um, coming back up here to our, our information here. We've got that P is 0.4. We've got that our sample size is 56. We've got that our successes, X, is 21. We're going to get that our P hat is always going to be our X divided by N. So that's my C14 divided by C13. We, what else do we know? We computed our standard error to be the square root of P, which is C12, times 1 minus P divided by N. So P times 1 minus P over N. Take the square root of the whole thing. Uh, uh, well, I didn't like that. I just need to be bigger. <laughs> 
12. What do we got here? Square root of C12. Oh, I didn't say times. <laughs> I was thinking about this like my calculator. Your calculator is down with just parentheses. Uh, Excel wants to see you do that asterisk right there for multiplication right there. So there's that 0 0.0655 that we got before for our standard error. And so now we can see that to compute our z-score, because we are normally distributed, we are using z-scores associated with this. In a proportion test, you will never use a t-distribution. Our z-score should be our p-hat, or yeah, p-hat minus, so p-hat is c15, minus the proportion popu or population, yeah, the population's proportion, which is going to be C4, or C12 in there, that's the 0.4, all divided by our standard error, which is C16. And that's giving me my z-score right here. That's telling me how unusual the sample is right here. This is telling me that this is only, this is basically like one-third of one standard deviation below normal. What this is saying to me is that this was not a very unusual sample to draw, even if the true proportion of residents supporting that candidate in that town really were 50%. We only just drew a sample that was less than a half of a standard deviation away from average. That's not that bad right there. So, let's just say it does not seem very extreme. That's a very small test statistic, right? It's really close to zero. That does not give us much evidence that we're wrong to think that 40% is the support in that town right there. So to compute our p-value, we are interested in the pro, uh, oh, by the way, notice that our alternative, uh, dog licking my arm while I'm trying to write right here, making that hard, um, that we were thinking that we've got a normal distribution that's centered at the 40% is the typical result that we would get from a sample. We got a sample that is only 0.38 below that, or standard deviations below that, right? So I'm kind of thinking that we basically just got this as our z value right here. Z equals negative 0.38. It's not far at all from that 0.4. Um, and by the way, this is not 0.38, which also, by the way, is about right there. We got 0.375. This is our p hat equals 0.375. Three seven five. This 0.38 is our number of standard deviations below average. That 0.375 is relative to the 0.4. So this is all of our p-value over here, and you should notice it looks like we're going to get a very large p-value. Um, large p-values result in us not rejecting the null hypothesis. We were thinking to ourselves that our alpha value cutoff is going to be like the 0.05. Right, that's our, a much smaller area that the, then is going to be left in that tail out here. So let's go ahead and compute what is the probability that z is less than negative 0.38. And I can do that over here. Let's go ahead and compute a p-value. P-value here should just be a straight up norm.dist. It is a left tail, which is what norm.dist does for us. I've got my z-value here. So this, this is our most straightforward one, norm.dist. It wants an oh, norm.s.dists because I've got my z value. What is the z value? Negative, negative 0.38. Cumulative, true. And that's going to tell me what's my p value? 0.3519. Let me write out some stuff here. So what does this p-value say to me? The p-value of 0.35197 says to me, if it really were true that our town supports the candidate the same as the rest of the state, which is at the 40% rate, if it were true that our town does do that, 40% support for this candidate, then the sample that we just drew that gave us only 37.5% support would occur 35% of the time if we kept on drawing samples like this. That says to me, this is a totally typical thing for us to experience, even if the 0.4 is the true value right here. We were thinking that maybe we were going to throw out the idea that in our town, the proportion that supports them is 40%. But if it were the case that it were 40%, this would not be an unusual sample to have drawn at all. This says to me, I don't really have any evidence that suggests that the 40% is wrong. If the 40% were right, the sample that we drew is very typical. It occurs 35% of the time. It's a huge probability, very large p-value right here.
Um, so let me kind of broadly say some of these things right here for our decision and conclusion. Then we'll just state a summary and we'll call it a day here. This says our sample was not very unusual relative to the null hypothesis. So this is sort of my general statement right here. I'm going to state more of my formal conclusion in a minute. I just want to get sort of my interpretation of some of these values out in writing. Um, so they're there instead of me just kind of saying my sort of choppy sentences here. Um, so now I'll state my more formal conclusion. But again, just to kind of reiterate what we just concluded here. Um, our p-value of 0.35197 says to us, if it really were true that our town supported the candidate at a 40% rate, then this sample is a sample that we should expect to see 35.19% of the time. That's pretty often. That says to me, this type of sample is not rare. This is not a rare sample at all. This says to me, I don't have a bunch of evidence that our null hypothesis is false. If our null hypothesis were true, we would see samples like this all the time, like the one that we just drew. That's sort of evidence suggesting that this that our null hypothesis is true, that our town probably does support the candidate at very, very near to exactly that 40% rate that the rest of the city does. Or at least it's saying to me, I don't have evidence that our town supports the candidates at a statistically less rate. Uh, than the rest of the state out there. So this data does not represent evidence that this town supports the candidate at a lower rate than the rest of the state. This is our alternative hypothesis, and I'm saying we do not have evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So let me kind of restate this now. So at the, uh, oh yeah. So notice by the way, yes, I'll, I'll just say here, at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level of significance. So remember, we wanted to see an event that occurred less than 5% of the time for us to throw out the null hypothesis. We saw an event that occurred 35% of the time. It was not a very rare event, not evidence for us to throw out the null hypothesis. So at the alpha equal 0.05 level of significance that was stated for us in the original problem, our data are not statistically significant. We had a p-value larger than alpha. We failed to reject the null hypothesis, and we conclude that we don't have enough information to legitimately claim that this town supports the candidate at a lower rate than 40%. And again, remember that we drew a sample that was 37.5% support. That is lower than 40% support, but what this uh, calculation just showed us here is that that 37.5% support compared to 40% support is not a major deviation that is likely due to just variation in sampling 
rather than to a true difference in support. Now, if we had sampled, for example, 500 people and found 37.5% support, then it's much more likely that we would be uh, reversing this claim right here. Um, in fact, I can uh, can I man I can't manually change it since these all reference each other right here. Um, but I guess if I change this from like 560 to 210, then we should still get the same proportions out here, 0.375. Um, oh, but I didn't use my I just typed in my. So notice that our Z score got much much more uh, broad out there, and now our P value. I should have just referenced this as my C17 right here. C17 that this now updates. Um, we're now seeing much smaller p values because we increased our sample size, even though our p hat stayed the same. Notice now if we bump this up to 5,600 people where 2,100 of them support the candidate, I'm still getting a success rate of 37.5%, but I'm now seeing that this is a very extreme result compared to that 40% that we saw out there. This is now more than, there's almost four standard deviations from normal because this is now a significantly more evidence. This is sampling 100 times as many people out there. And so if we now see this 37.5% with a huge sample, this is not very strong evidence that this is a very, uh, very big deviation from that 40% statewide. But again, when we just take a small sample of 56 people and see that rate that we did, that's just not enough information for us to be legitimately claiming that that was different. And so we see large p-values likely to see results like this, um, even if the true value is 0.4 out there. So again, I think it's a really good thing to kind of play around with some of your numbers out here in Excel um, by, by doing those, those references right there in Excel. So let's briefly summarize and wrap this thing up right here. What have we seen for our three significance tests that we've done? The first test that we did was our uh, one sample test for a population mean when sigma is known. And let's state here, it's relatively rare that these ever really come up in real life because how could we ever know sigma without also knowing mu? Whatever data you collect to get one of those, you have the data for the other. So these, these don't typically happen that often. Our distribution of our sample mean in these cases here is going to be that our x bar is distributed normally with a mu and a sigma over root n. We're going to compute our test statistics as z equals x bar minus mu over sigma over root n. It's the sample average minus the population average over the standard error. For our one sample test for the population mean where sigma is sigma is unknown, then in these cases here, our distribution of the sample mean is going to follow a t distribution. Uh, and let me just say here, our, our sample averages x bar follow a t distribution. Our average is still centered at the average there, but we now use the standard error of s over root n for that guy. Our test statistic is a t value it's still going to be computed the same way though, right? X minus mu sample minus average or sample minus population averages over S over root N. We're just using our slightly different um, standard error or standard deviation and standard error terms right there because we don't know sigma, but we do know S or just our sample standard deviation. Finally, we then looked at our one sample test for the population proportion. We saw that our sample mean uh, what's our, how is that going to be distributed? Our distribution of the sample proportion, we're not talking mean. And so that's where we're going to be saying that p hat, our sample proportion, is distributed normally. Where is our distribution centered? Well, our most likely thing to get is the true population average as suggested by the null hypothesis. And what is the standard error term that's associated with this guy here? Uh, we got this to be p times, and I'm gonna write this as one minus p over n. This is the same thing as square root of pq over the square root of n. Those are all just different rephrasings of each other. Those are all, all the same thing, whichever one you're, you're happy with right there. So the point here is, even though this underlying distribution is binomial, the central limit theorem is going to tell us as long as our sample size is large enough, that our bino the averages that we get for our proportion, the average proportion, will follow a normal distribution that is centered at our null hypothesized P 
and has a standard error also associated with P, but notice again, it's got that squared event on the bottom right there. In these cases, our test statistic is going to be a Z test statistic. We're gonna get similar breakdowns as we got up above here. We're gonna get our sample information, P hat, minus our population information, P, all divided by our standard error term. All right. So recognize that the structure of all three test statistics is the exact same. Sample minus population divided by standard error in all three cases right here. We just got to keep track of the fact that if we're talking about means and sigma is unknown, then we got to be using the T distribution instead of the Z distribution for our computations that are out there. All right. So these are the three hypothesis tests that we have that are associated with chapter nine. And let me just wrap up by saying we're going to start next week by, oh, let me just write this right here, P hat is sample proportion. P is the population proportion. Right. Um, what we're going to do next week is we're going to go back to chapter 8. In chapter 8, we're going to talk confidence intervals. And the good thing about confidence intervals is that they're going to have the exact same breakdown as our hypothesis tests. We're going to see three confidence intervals next week. And all three confidence intervals are going to be exactly these three scenarios. We're going to have a confidence interval for population means when sigma is known. We're going to have a confidence interval for population means when sigma is unknown. We're going to have population, or we're going to have uh, confidence intervals for population proportions. Right? All three of those things. This exact breakdown of these three groups here. We're going to compute what we're going to call confidence intervals uh, for them next week. So this breakdown is going to kind of follow us around out here. Do you know sigma or not for the means? And we can deal with proportions using our a normal approximation um, based on the central limit theorem right here. So that's gonna wrap it up for us here for this week. You are now responsible for three different types of significance tests. Next week, we're going to get the confidence intervals that are sort of the partners of these significance tests right here. After that week, we're gonna go off and see a bunch more of these significance that we have. Our two samples significant or hypothesis tests, uh, as well as our tests for um, variance and our tests for distribution out there. So those are all coming up in the next few weeks. Um, happy week nine, everybody. Go ahead and hit that. Oh, by the way, there is our written homework finally this week. Um, these computations really, really matter. So our, our my open math and the written homework are well, maybe a little bit bulkier than they were in the past, but this is basically what you should expect things to be like, I think, for the rest of the semester out here. So um, be on those. Uh, don't fall behind right now or things are going to actually get kind of hairy for you. Um, and be sure to ask me any questions that you've got. We're, we're kind of into a more verbal and more technical part of the semester than we were in the past. Um, so be sure to hit me up with any clarifications that you need, big or small. Just email me, come to office hours, stuff like that, and I can help you out, square you away there. Have a good uh, week nine, everybody.